Good evening, dear colleagues. A very warm welcome to this evening's presentation, the fifth presentation in Dentistry's Great Awakening series. We've had a wonderful, we've had wonderful presentations um, up to now, having had Roger Price, Patrick McCure, and John Flutter, and Sarah Hornsby. It is my greatest pleasure to introduce my friend and our colleague, Dr. Barry Rafel. But before I do, I just need to do some um, house rules. First of all, please refrain from using the raised hand, but type your comments and questions in the question and A tab. CPD certificates will be loaded to the SATA platform and you'll be able to access all your certificates under your member profile. If you are not a SADA member, you will be able to create a profile for yourself and access your CPD certificates. The event for tonight qualifies for one clinical CEU. We are also streaming live on YouTube, just in case you have difficulty accessing the Zoom platform. There are upcoming webinars that I would like to share with you. Um, one of them, of course, is going to be the SADA Dental and Oral Health Virtual Congress, which will stream live from the 27th to the 29th of August. And the theme being back to the basics, excellence in dentistry. And um, I promise you it's going to be wonderful. There are being the, the most amazing speakers are being invited and prepared for you for this year. And then on June the 29th, um, there will be a presentation by Mr. Ishmael Mohapi of GEMS. And the presentation he will give is the impact of fraud, waste and abuse on our medical scheme system. Good. So Barry, back to you, my friend. Um, I'm going to just give you a brief introduction um, because I think a lot of an, an, a good number of our aud audience are very familiar with you already. And um, <laughs> I'll never forget when um, <clears throat> I first um, looked at doing Skip Truitt's courses way back in the early 2000s. I bought all his DVDs first and went through them over and over and over again until eventually <clears throat> I felt he was a friend of mine. And when I first emailed to say to him that I'm going to be attending um, your courses, and I said, um, um, you know what, I know you already very well, but you don't know me. And since that day, we've been very, very close friends. But um, Dr. Rafel is a specialist orthodontist based in Clifton, New Jersey, in the United States, with almost 40 years of experience as an orthodontist. He is widely regarded as a leader in the field of early, integrative and airway focused orthodontics. His approach to correcting facial growth, providing an optimal physiological airway and breathing pattern in, for children is based on a fundamental rethinking of the optimization of our health and that minimization and, and that of minimization of threats such as orofacial myology disorders to our health. Thank you everyone for being part of this event and Barry, thank you very much for being available to give a presentation and all the best luck with the presentation. I will hop off the bus for the moment. And once you've finished your presentation, I'll hop back on again and I'll pose some questions to you, which we look forward to your answering. Good. Take Good. care, my friend. Thank you so much for having me. I wish I could be there in person. My heart goes out to all of you there in South Africa for two reasons. Number one, I know you're battling with the third wave of this pandemic, and, um, and it sounds, sounds lousy. And we've been through our, our biggest peak so far, and we're on the mend, but of course, who knows? Secondly, the, the effort that you are making to look at this new, um, new possibility for dentistry, I think is, is a terrific thing. And I'm so happy to support you in whatever way I can. Thank so I know um, Ditz had asked me to do a lecture based on the title, Is Eight Too Late? And um, I, I am gonna say yes. It, not not always too late, but it's too late for some things. We'll talk a little bit about that. 
Um, I did um, decide I was going to change the title though, uh, simply because I want to set a context for what you guys are doing, what you want to learn. And uh, let me see, I'm just going to hide the video panel here so that my screen is clear. And the title that I'd like it to be is not everything is airway, but airway is everything. And it really is a change of context. Um, before I get started, these are my disclosures. Um, a particular interest is that I'm now a co-director of an educational institute called the Airway Collaborative. Um, I do get paid also by the myofunctional research company simply for honorarium and expenses. I have no other fiscal uh, uh, collaboration with them. I am uh, intimately involved with the dental societies here in the US, including the American Dental Associ Association and the American Association of Orthodontists, and I support their cause. So this is the purpose of the lecture to emphasize that addressing children's airway health is important that the problem really is not so much about sleep and it's really not about teeth. The problem is about breathing and the problems start early in life. I want you to know that we have the protocols and perhaps you've already heard a good bit of them from the previous speakers in this series, all of whom I've studied with. Um, and there are other practitioners, including many orthodontists that are already doing this work. And of course, that's not enough. Um, this is a endemic problem in our population. And it's something we need to take to pay attention to. So when one of my mentors said context is everything, I really took it to heart and understand that the way we think about things, the way we choose treatment plans, the way we carry them out, happens to be influenced by the, by the context we were educated in. And as I'm going to show you, that context is very much changing. Um, this was an article that, that, um, that I saw this morning in the New York Times um, about how much of what we are doing, despite perhaps our former glory, is not headed in the right direction that um, quality of life um, is, is uh, going backward in terms of overall well-being, um, that uh, we think our children are just not doing as well. Um, and perhaps they're, they're referring to the ability of children to make a living, but um, the, the idea that we're falling short of these goals you know, is something that we take seriously. And I'm going to suggest that this is not a, a political or, a, um, uh, a, a, or an economic statement. This is very much a reflection of overall wellness and well-being in terms of health of our children. We know that the world is being challenged, not just by a viral pandemic, but even more than that. 70% of deaths worldwide are related to chronic non-communicable diseases. Uh, these diseases are um, a, a more, more prevalent now than they were even just a few hundred years ago. And so um, this is really the big challenge to overall health. And so I, I know this is gonna take several minutes to play but I want you to take it very seriously because if I have any underlying motivation to, um, to get through the challenges and frustrations of doing something in my profession that's new, maybe somewhat uncharted, it's this that keeps me going. I usually play this video at the end of my lectures, but I'm going to start out with it. If you look at the bottom, it lists a number of chronic non-communicable diseases of civilization that children are suffering from. ADHD, asthma, eczema, autism, allergies, rheumatoid arthritis, mood disorders, type two diabetes, 
which as you remember, used to be called adult onset diabetes. And um, this particular uh, a producer of this, this video had two children that had that kind of allergy where they would have an anaphylactic reaction if they came in contact with peanuts. I, it, this was an unheard of in my childhood and is, is a symbol of a burgeoning problem that our children are suffering. So I'd like you to take a few minutes and watch this video. The government says autism is showing up in children more than before. One in 50 school children has a form of autism. Asthma rates rising dramatically over the past decade. More than one in seven children in the U.S. receiving a diagnosis of ADHD. Numbers from the CDC have steadily increased in the past decade. In the last 30 years, obesity rates for kids have tripled. Frightening to parents to hear those dramatic numbers. It may reduce the life expectancy of this generation of children and diminish their quality of life. Our kids are sick. They're screaming out. They want help. He still didn't have a single word. He was drooling. He was rubbing his head against the carpet. He was pushing himself into walls. His eyes swelled shut. He was covered with hives from head to foot. Probably around 14, 15 months, all that language disappeared. <laughs> From all that I can see, it looks like we've got a child here with pervasive developmental delay. Noah, Noah, you keep holding your stomach. Does your side hurt? <laughs> Having a child with autism, it's not. It's not a human vision. Unfortunately, today, too many of our children, by analogy, function as canaries in the coal mine. They are teaching us that something is deeply out of order, deeply imbalanced, deeply in need of understanding, and largely lacking in therapy. I think the first step to transforming this problem is to, to understand it. And we have not done a great job at that in healthcare. We know that when our bodies are hit with toxins, it interferes with our biochemistry. They are not prepared for handling the 85,000 toxic chemicals on the market. Whatever is lacking of essential nutrients that the body cannot make is going to control that whole system of cellular biology. The brain is a physical organ of the body and its health depends on the health of the cells. And when we address the body problems, the brain problems start to resolve. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the pediatricians I went to see basically told me there was no chance for recovery. Your son was just born with this, and uh, it would be best for you and your husband to just accept your new normal. I knew Ben was going to get better the day I got the diagnosis. He's not going to get better. No, I'm not really hearing that. When you tell a person that there's no hope, that their child will always be this way, that there's nothing you can do about it, that's not science. That's a misuse of statistics. The doctor said, um, no, your boy will have autism for a very long time, but my mother didn't give up. She kept on thinking of ways to try and get rid of autism. There is an abundance of intriguing individual cases or what we call anecdotes. They cry out to be better studied and documented. So to think that just a few short years ago, he had to be in a room with an air purifier plugged in to his nebulizer, you know, flash forward to now, and he loves to hike and he loves to be outside. He couldn't do that a couple years ago. People say kids can't recover. Well, they do recover, I've seen it. I've seen kids recover from autism, from ADHD, from Tourette's, I've seen it. I feel like his true personality is coming through again. He has so many friends. He's got more best friends than I can count. <laughs> when he's doing BMX at the track and I'm sitting there watching him. Come on, go, go! I just know that there's no limits to what he can do. If we do the science deeply, we will be able to document in ways that cannot be dismissed what many of us think we've been observing anecdotally, which is the improvements in these children. 
this is one of the most important public health and scientific issues. We need to figure out how these people get better and reverse engineer it so we can do it for everyone. Research has been largely fragmented across different communities and in different silos. And I agree with our colleagues. There is no sufficiently documented comprehensive study that has thus far been executed. That's part of the fierce urgency for now. We've been trained to believe that these illnesses are genetic and inborn and we need some kind of scientific miracle. That's not what we need right now. We need a fundamental rethinking on the optimization of our health and the minimization of threats to our health. <laughs> As we blaze this trail, others can learn, as we have, that it is possible to look at the individual, to remove obstacles to recovery, to evoke healing responses, and to do that in a way that is both very personal and rigorously scientific. We're losing a generation of children. That's what's at stake. If we project the current trends forward just half a century, everyone will be in a hospital bed taking care of the person next to them. We cannot continue on the current trajectory, and yet it shows no signs of abating. Clearly there's just, there's something going on and there's something wrong when I can walk into a room of 20 kids and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's at least one EpiPen in that room. The economic cost is astronomical to our society and, and the societal costs alone are, are tremendous. Something is hurting our children and pretty soon it's going to be one and two and then what? Then are we going to look at the issue? The time is now for the scientific community to take recovery, environment and nutrition seriously. Our future depends on it. We need to start talking about our children's health. The first day that I dropped him off and I picked him up and I put him in the car and I was like, did you have a great day at school? He's like, oh, I had a great day at school. And I was like, I am so proud of you, Connor. And from the back seat, I hear, oh, I'm so proud of you too, mom. I'm like, no, I'm proud of you. And I'm, no, I'm proud of you. I won. I won, and I'm here. The reason why I'm doing this is I'm here to other to tell other parents, like, you can win, too. And I'm here to tell other dentists that they can win, too. The, the world of chronic disease includes all these things that you see here that are happening in a greater frequency, a greater intensity, and unfortunately at earlier and earlier ages. I, I bet every one of you, you got, we have over 600, almost 700 people here. I bet every one of you has been touched either directly or indirectly through your family by one of these diseases. And they were not common only a few hundred years ago. And it includes the things we do in dentistry every single day. How many times has an orthodontist said to a child, oh, you were born with crooked teeth. You, you know, come back when your baby teeth fall out, we'll, we'll do braces. And yet what my, my premise is, is that malocclusion is just one of the first symptoms to show up in a, in a, a population that is going to be suffering these chronic diseases. Just a little bit of background about me and how I got so worked up about all this. I, you know, I started uh, general practice for, for a few years and then went back into practice with my dad. Um, my, my, I built my best office, my dream office uh, already uh, 20 years ago. It's just west of Manhattan, um, maybe 12 miles out uh, out, outside the city. Um, I made it bright and, and, and uh, friendly looking and clean and we hid all the instruments and we have a whiteboard that kids are, it's, I really enjoy orthodontics. Uh, over the years, I had always looked for better ways of doing things, different kinds of brackets and light wire, low force, low friction. Um, you know, I'm getting into the digital world and, and uh, uh, using that to help plan treatment and carry it out. There are new techniques in orthodontics that are uh, using different forms of biology to enhance 
uh, tooth movement and, and bone uh, adaptation and so forth. Uh, we're able to do things with braces that we were never able to do even just a few years ago. I mean, I, in, my, in my residency, I never would have dreamed that I could pull that off, and yet I can do it relatively routinely now. The fact that when I joined my dad in practice, he was extracting teeth in 65% of cases, and now I'm probably re, uh, uh, you know, opening up extraction spaces more than I'm creating them uh, is a testament to how we've been able to advance. But there are limits to orthodontics. And, you know, I have colleagues that will brag about how stable their cases are, even when we've cemented the, 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 the anterior teeth together. We know that teeth don't stay. And we've just accepted it as a, a natural part of life. And you, you know, using fixed retention and lifetime retention is uh, similar to the way we use glasses and contacts, just something culturally we've come to adopt. But um, I, I've learned some other things about why teeth get crooked and why they won't stay straight. And that very much it's about facial growth. Now, there's a good section of orthodontics that, that looks at functional orthopedics in ways that try to address the fact that the jaws are not growing properly. I, I will say that I, I understand now why the research on these appliances is so limited because all of them have as many um, a, a side effects as they do benefits. And I do use them. Sometimes I'm boxed into a corner and this is the best I can do. But something changed for me uh, a few years ago when I was uh, just having a rash of these pain in the ass problems that, um, that, we, that all orthodontists face. And that is we're trying to get the teeth to come together and the damn tongue is in the way. And so we'll throw the, the, you know, the kitchen, everything in the kitchen sink at the tongue, trying to tame it as if uh, putting, say, a lion in a cage trains it. Uh, putting a tongue in a cage really does not train it. And what I've learned now is, in fact, the tongue is the animal in the cage. Teeth are just the cage. So I started to get this deep appreciation for soft tissue dysfunction when I read this article by Herman Ramirez. It was about the trainer system from Myobrace. And he said one thing that kind of tickled my brain and it took a while for it to sink in. And it was this, soft tissue dysfunction is T-H-E cause of malocclusion. Now, yes, I know about thumb sucking and tongue thrusting and every orthodontist kind of acknowledges that the muscles can get in the way. But to say that malocclusion is primarily caused by soft tissue dysfunction, that soft tissue dysfunction is extant in every case of malocclusion was something that I was not willing to, um, to, 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 to accept at the time. But I learned as, as uh, time goes, time went on that, um, that this is largely the case. Uh, this is a, uh, an email from last week. And um, by the way, it's uh, Skip Truitt's on this little thread, um, along with uh, some of the other people that you'll be hearing from in your uh, series here, including John Mew. And it was about the idea that um, dentistry and orthodontics in particular carry with it certain um, fundamental beliefs that I now call orthodoxies that we have been for better or for worse passing on from generation to generation of orthodontists and dentists. And this one comes from 1904 in a book by Jackson who actually had a lot of good ideas about uh, uh, dealing with growth and development in children but um, he said, one of the most frequent causes of dental irregularity is the intermarriage of individuals of different race characteristics. 
And I had been repeating this to parents when a mother asked me, why does my child have crooked teeth? I would say, well, you, she got the size of her teeth from one parent and the size of the jaws from the other, or vice versa, or, or come up with something that I knew was overly simplistic, you know, because of course, malocclusion is multifactorial. But um, it, it, it was underpinning my own belief that when a child has crooked teeth, they were destined to have crooked teeth. And this article from uh, Ramirez and the learnings that I picked up from Chris Farrell and John Flutter and, and uh, many of uh, my mentors over these past decade was that, no, there are no genes for crooked teeth and that there are other reasons that teeth get crooked. So um, I was president of the New Jersey chapter of the American Association of Orthodontists. And they sent us down to the Capitol, not to riot, mind you, but to learn about leadership. And the topic at, at uh, this leadership conference was about orthodoxies and how their beliefs that we carry with us, sometimes they're not even stated. For instance, when I went to ortho school, I knew that crooked teeth were the problem and that braces was the solution. I mean, it's just ingrained. Uh, so many of these things are ingrained in, in our culture. Parents now think that it's important to give kids braces and they accept it as part of child rearing, uh, like the, I don't know what your, your, your cultural uh, milestones are, but a sweet 16 party, a bar mitzvah, a wedding, a, you know, college tuition, it's just, part of what you do as a parent. But the orthodoxies in orthodontics were um, something that I had to come to terms with. So malocclusion is the problem. Genetics is the ideology. The shape of the face is a characteristic, right? We measure the seps and we, we uh, use the angle classification to, to, to uh, talk about the phenotype but we assume that that was what the patient was destined for. Of course, we're limited by social and legal caveat to take care of the teeth and jaws and not get out of our scope of practice. Um, orthodontists in particular have, uh, ha have drifted towards this idea of eliminating cooperation for predictability. And to make a long story short, the way I now think of things is almost 180 degree change. No longer is malocclusion the problem, but malocclusion is basically a symptom. In fact, malocclusion is a solution for the body to find balance and homeostasis. Uh, thank you, Dave Singh, for that quote, that the, the body is just expressing an imbalance that's going on that really has nothing to do with the teeth. It's not genetics as the ideology, even though our kids look like us, we do pass on genetic traits, but it's not so much the uh, directly related to the teeth as it is to the milieu that the teeth come into. And that when the soft tissue function is improper, that that more than anything is going to change not only the way the teeth come in, but the way the bones grow as well. So the shape of the face is not just a characteristic, it is a risk factor if it's not growing properly. We assume that the face we have is the one we were meant to have when we were born. And it, it's, it, I'm not gonna say nothing is farther from the truth, but it's not always the truth. Our faces are adapting to, um, to environmental input. And what we wind up with is a, is a summation of how the uh, genes have been uh, directed to produce protein and growth factors and, and, uh, and, and muscle factors and, and all that. While our scope might be limited to teeth and jaws, we now have the responsibility to pay attention to the rest of the child. I mean, in orthodontics, it's almost silly if to prove our prowess, you know, we do this thing called plaster on the table, put the models next to each other before and after. If 
you've uh, obsessively corrected every marginal ridge rotation and, and, and guidance factor, you can call yourself a good orthodontist, but never once do we ask the way we straighten the teeth, does that match with the child's needs the, the, and, and, uh, and physiology? And the thing about eliminating cooperation is really a problem because when we start to understand that the habits that we adopt are, that the habits we adopt are the reason that the teeth get crooked, we also have to understand that we have to change the behaviors and habits that cause them. And if we don't do that, nothing changes. I think this is uh, one way that John Flutter will talk about it. So I went through uh, from that point forward, a good 10, 12 years of learning. Of course, I'm still learning, but I had to learn from, uh, from, from John and, and Chris and Herman about soft tissue function. I learned about myofunctional therapy. I learned about breathing and sleep. I learned about how to uh, help jaws grow forward in the face. I learned about biomimetics where we tap into the natural ability of the body to grow properly. I learned about the whole body and, and how the brain works and the fascia and the, and, and the posture and how all that's related. I, I learned about how to help an adult's jaws grow as well as, um, as a child's. And I learned about the three-dimensional ways of looking at, at teeth um, uh, and, and, and the airway and, the, and the, uh, the formation of the head and so forth. And then I just surreptitiously got asked to speak at a local uh, pediatric dental residency. Um, I met uh, Mark Cruz at a, uh, uh, at a, a, a bioblock course and it's, it's really changed my life. I, when, as I teach, and I thank you for the compliments, but as I teach, I, I certainly know that I've been standing on the shoulders of all these people that very little that comes out of my mouth is original, maybe because I'm an orthodontist and ventured out onto this limb that I have put together things maybe in a, um, a unique way, kind of like the Beatles, if you remember their derivative music. Um, the premise of what we're talking about, and Mark and I used to talk about this on our uh, Zoom cast, was that evolution helped us develop certain number of competencies that helped us survive and reproduce. And that these competencies, especially the ones that developed when we were uh, that we started to um, develop when we stood up on two feet. And then later when we began to um, be able to manipulate sounds uh, and, and airflow so that we could talk, they, um, they allowed us to dramatically change our environment. And probably these last four or 500 years since the industrial revolution, since the refinement of sugar, um, since uh, industrial foods, it, 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 it has changed our, our, our environment so dramatically that all the good things of our environment are also have uh, concomitant stressors. And so our body has had to compensate to adopt and adapt to these many changes. And unfortunately, the compensations, while they may help us uh, mimic the competencies that we're, we have, they also have unintended consequences. And malocclusion carries and sleep-related breathing uh, problems are part of those compromises. And then they circle around in a vicious way where our health gets worse and worse and worse. And by the generations, this is why we're seeing the increase in, in, uh, in chronic diseases. Well, four years later, I said I was going to throw my hat into the ring and rebrand myself. This pre <laughs> prevented me from quitting in the, in the many times that I thought I would rather just straighten teeth and be done with it. Um, but I was um, enthusiastic enough to write every word of the contact of con content of my websites, trying to 
help people understand why addressing soft tissue dysfunction is the better way to help a child grow up. And um, I got a new logo and then another website and, you know, brochures and all that kind of stuff. I also expanded the services in my uh, practice because, and there's Roger Price, who you've already met. Uh, he was in residence with me for four years, uh, building um, a facility that could handle the, the, the child attached to the teeth was an important aspect of being able to address the whole problem. Uh, now we, um, oh, I meant to skip that slide. Okay, so, but um, as I'm learning, I'm meeting people of different backgrounds some orthodontists, some orthodentists, some myofunctional therapists, um, all of us who are kind of attacking this problem in different ways. And I brought this group together as part of an annual session for the American uh, Academy of Physiologic Medicine and Dentistry. Um, included there in the middle is the upcoming president of the AAO. Um, and, um, and brought them together to talk about this issue on a common ground, and we found a lot of common ground. It has always been, uh, uh, since I made this transition, a uh, kind of mission of mine to interest orthodontists in, the, in, this, um, in this, this topic and bringing the ROs, that's real orthodontists, to the table has been a project of mine ever since. Um, and uh, as the years go by, the, um, the, the, the number of people that are getting involved grows. Uh, Dwayne Grummans and I co-hosted a program for the AAPMD last year called The F Future of Orthodontics. And we had speakers that are, pr many of whom are prominent orthodontists in the US. And uh, if you're an orthodontist, uh, you know, watching this, you may recognize many of the names there. They are educators, they are researchers, they are, and there's some physicians that understand the, the role of growth and development and all that. So <clears throat> things are coming together, despite the AAO's stiff arming of this, um, this issue, um, by limiting our role to uh, screening, the ADA has taken a much more vigorous, the American Dental Association has taken a much more vigorous stance in their 2017 policy on the treatment of sleep-related breathing disorders. And while this is also somewhat of a defensive document suggesting that dentists cannot treat or a diagnose obstructive sleep apnea, that it is a medical problem, that we are there to um, be um, helpful to the physician. In children, the, the, um, the recommendation was not quite so circumspect. In children, because they don't really suffer sleep apnea uh, quite as readily, it, the ADA determined that it was important that we do screening through history and clinical examination to identify the signs and symptoms of deficient growth and development. Now, when they said that, boy, my eyes opened wide because we do understand that it's growth and development that are the, the major risk factor for sleep-related breathing disorders. And that if we see these risks are there, we can intervene through medical or dental referral and evidence-based treatment. And yes, we don't have the evidence for everything, but we are developing it. And year by year, the evidence becomes clearer and clearer. And that is the shape of the face is a primary risk factor for breathing disorders. And so when we do these treatments and we help a child breathe uh, better, we are now um, uh, um, we we are now responsible for helping children develop an optimal physiologic airway and breathing pattern.
And I'd just like you to jot that down somewhere, put it on a sticky note and put it up in your office. And I'd like you to look at it every once in a while and think to yourself, but I'm a dentist. I treat teeth. But the teeth are the canary in the coal mine. They are the sign that a child is imminently going to express other chronic diseases of uh, modern civilization. And that one of them, and the most important one, is the development of their airway and the way a child uses it. So uh, the ADA has allowed a number of us to work together on supporting them in this policy. Uh, and three years ago, uh, we brought together some of the major names in medicine and dentistry to, that are involved in this area to gather and start talking about what the issues were, what they are, how to deal with them, and then how to support the ADA in this process. And so over the past three years, the American Dental Association has had conferences, well attended, standing room only, um, for people that want to deal with this, you know, this issue. Uh, this year, they came out with a new brochure on children's airways, and I think they, they um, articulated it beautifully. Sleep disorders can be a complicated topic to discuss with patients, especially parents. Use this brochure to begin a conversation about why parents should pay attention to children's breathing during sleep and wake and highlight some of the behavioral signs that may point to possible sleep disorder. You know, a lot of people are just not familiar with what to look for. And once you learn what to look for, you almost uh, can't not see it. It's everywhere. Look at that boy's mouth posture. The lips are apart. We know the tongue is not on the roof of the mouth. He may be breathing through his nose, but he's also exp expelling carbon dioxide through his mouth. And likely when he swallows, he's got some kind of soft tissue dysfunction that goes along with it. So we could talk a little bit about breathing. I suspect from what I heard uh, this morning that a lot of you are familiar with this concept already. So I'm gonna go pretty quickly through this information and there are ways to learn more about it. But breathing through the nose, um, it should be an easy thing to do. Air should flow smoothly from the tip of the nose to the bottom of the throat and then of course into the lungs when the speed of the air or the narrowness of the airway creates turbulence and negative pressure, then it pulls on the sidewalls of the airway, making them flutter, or worse, of course, making them close off entirely, which is sleep apnea. But there's a much longer lead up to OSA than we have understood before. And it's really that period of time, uh, that, 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 um, that gradation between snoring and when your brain actually quits trying to keep your airway open that we call flow limitation and upper airway resistance syndrome. This is the most important thing that we deal with. This is not so much a medical issue, although it has lots of medical comorbidities. It is directly related to the size and shape and, and physiology of the airway and the way we breathe. That we want to be able to create laminar flow through the tube and undo turbulent flow. And anything we can do to do that's gonna make it easier for a person to breathe. So what creates turbulence? There's actually three things that you need to know about. One is structure, two is function, three is behavior. By structure, we're talking about the size and shape of the airway, the contours, and that's from the tip of the nose to the bottom of the throat. For function, we're talking about the stability of the airway or its resilience, it, its um, uh, ab ability to resist collapse under negative pressure. And then, of course, the last one, and I think the one that most people do not deal with very well, is the urgency to, when I say people, most people that are teaching this 
well, I, now I got to correct myself. You had Roger Price, you had uh, Patrick McEwen. Uh, you guys should understand that this need to take the next breath is a major motivator every second of the day. And that when we have to make compensations to do that, it becomes usually a habit. So um, size and shape of the airway, the, there are trouble spots all through the airway. It could be the, the nasal passages at the nares, um, the, the nasal cartilages, the mucus, the poor hygiene. It can be in that really fascinating two inches um, of, um, of nasal capsule between the nose and the throat where the turbinates can be swollen, they can, uh, the, the sinus is gonna be clogged, polyp cyst, the deviated septum, cocking off to the side, which frankly is a growth pattern, a problem. And the fact that the maxilla is not developed, all of these can create turbulence within that um, middle part of the airway. Of course, at the top of the, the, um, the, uh, the throat, and the nasopharynx, uh, maxillary deficiency is a major cause of shortening or narrowing of the airway, along with the swollen adenoids, the soft palate, and the, the inflammation that's caused um, often by trauma, traumatic snoring or um, acid uh, reflux and so forth. And then at the bottom of the throat, we have all kinds of things to look for and not just swollen tonsils. Um, we also have to make sure that the tongue has enough room in the front of the mouth so it's not backed up into the rear of the mouth. If, if you, and um, uh, uh, borrowing from the title of Felix Lau's book, Six Foot Tiger, Three Foot Cage, it's just a perfect uh, metaphor for the idea that if you don't have jaws that have developed big enough and give enough room for the tongue in the front of the mouth, the tongue has to go somewhere. Yeah, sometimes it does come out the front of the mouth and many tongue thrusts and major tongue habits are the result of the tongue being an airway dilator, just trying to get the heck out of the way so that a person can breathe. And then of course, many times it gets crowded in by these narrow jaws and serves to um, block the airway. Now we have to push the hyoid uh, bone down to get the tongue out of the way. And these are all the adaptations that we find when people have to breathe. So we understand, and the research backs us up, that the depth of the face is a primary risk factor for uh, the nasopharynx and the, and the oropharynx because it signifies just how big the airway can be. That while we always believed that sleep apnea was related to uh, BMI and obesity and a large neck, I look at those as aggravating factors. It's really the early growth that a person has had that determines whether they're going to be susceptible to flow limitation. And this is why we see fit skinny women having as many breathing problems as old fat men. The idea that the jaws need to grow forward in order to give enough airway, I think is adequately um, uh, justified by, um, by the, the research. And although it's hard for us to accept because many of our orthodontic treatments are actually retractive in nature, it should become obvious to each and every orthodontist that there is a way to open up the back of the throat and there's a way to close the back of the throat. And if it were you or your child, which one would you choose? Yes, there's some research that's, that goes around that says, oh, that you can take out teeth and, and not cause a problem. Well, of course, there's a, you know, a bell curve in everything we do. But just looking at the the, the, um, the, the logic of wanting to help a child breathe better and give them a bigger airway, it, it, you can't help but think that getting the teeth out of the way and the bones growing forward is gonna be important. Uh, this is just such a fascinating study. I could probably spend 15 minutes on it, 
but kids that breathe through their mouth have an airway that's literally half the size of kids that breathe through their nose. Now, you could say there's a chicken and egg thing going on here, um, and maybe there is, but I'm going to suggest that when you breathe through your nose and you tame the soft tissue functions, that your, the forward part of your face will grow better and hence you will have a better airway. Nasal breathing begets better facial growth. And the, 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 uh, the, the understanding that we need to have as far as biology is that the maxilla is really a very thin bone that is um, significantly influenced by its surroundings. We already know that intramembranous bone grows because of the structures and functions that surround it. Our bone, our, our skull grows because of the brain, not the brain growing into the skull. Same thing with our orbits. You never have an orbit that's too big for an eyeball. Um, the, the interesting thing about the nasal structures is that they grow better when you use them and they tend to grow worse when you don't. So why should it be any surprise that the tongue needs to be part of that, that, um, that environment for the growth of the maxilla? Uh, Moss's functional matrix hypothesis uh, back in the, um, in the 60s and 70s and, and 80s was a major um, uh, a paradigm shift and it was very hard to read because I remember going through it you know, in my uh, early years but the, the, uh, the premise is very clear. The genome for the, be the growing bone does not have the information needed to regulate its ultimate size and shape. It has the biology to grow um, the, and the cells certainly know how to create and remodel bone, but the final shape depends upon the um, the guidance that's given it through the um, through the environment, mechanical forces regulate sutural growth by inducing sutural mechanical strain. In other words, you use your mouth to chew and eat and swallow and breathe. You use your nose to breathe. You use your 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 muscles to hold your head up and your 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 muscles to chew and all that, and that produces mechanical strain of all kinds. And it's really the summary of all these things that turn the genes on and the transcription factors and so forth that that um, that, that that help the bone to grow and express itself through these mechanotransduction pathways. And one of the premises of bone biology is that we can mimic these mechanotransduction pathways in the way that the muscles would if they were working properly. So we have to pay attention to the way we chew, the, the things we chew, the way we, we uh, uh, nurse early on, the way we use our muscles, the way the, the, the tongue, the, the way the tongue um, uh, acts uh, 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 during function. And, um, and, and even the jaw joints, we, we know that the biology for this is that um, loading cr changes the way the bones will form. And I love the way that Susan Herring from the University of Washington, who by the way, was not very complimentary about my visit there some years ago, says that the assumption of a skeleton which is completely determined by, by bone genes is not only simplistic, but for the most part false. John Mew has been trying to tell us this for decades. Because the genetic control of skeletal growth is not precise, the articulation of the teeth and jaws depends upon additional guidance from oral posture. So the fact that the bones uh, adapt to spaces if the tongue is resting lower than on the roof of the mouth, then it changes the forces that surround the bone and the bone collapses. And mind you, it collapses in three dimensions of space. It's not just palatal width that we're looking at. The whole mid face, including the nasal structures, change shape because that's all maxilla all the way up 
to the infraorbital rim. They all change shape. The nasal uh, septum changes shape because that bone changes shape. We learned this from Harvold's monkey studies and, um, and I see it in practice every day. When you can't breathe through your nose, your mouth has to hang open because that's the only other way to breathe. When your mouth hangs open for a period of time, it's going to distort the facial structure. Now, the thing that, that, that confused orthodontists so much about these studies was that every monkey developed a different malocclusion. How could that be? How could one uh, uh, initial condition create a class one malocclusion, a class two mal, class three malocclusion. It didn't make sense. Why? Because we think that the phenotype that results also describes the origin and the etiology, and it does not. And this more, this, this one ex, um, uh, investigation, I think illustrated it beautifully, that the ultimate phenotype can have um, uh, many phenotypes can have uh, one etiology, and that is soft tissue dysfunction. Here's two monkeys too, and they are literally twins, genetically identical with different environmental um, uh, causes, and they look so differently because their skulls grew differently. So I, you know, I've been using this. Um, this metaphor since, since I started teaching because really it describes very well what we see. And that is a broad arch. And I, I really should change these pictures now because to me, they both have narrow arches, but they see how the teeth have lined up. The point is this, when you build an arch, you know, before you start stacking up the blocks, you need to roll in uh, a support structure you know, a, a, a scaffold. And uh, that's what allows the blocks to stay up straight. You take the scaffold away and now the blocks settle in. It's very uh, stable structure. If you have a, a no scaffold, you're never gonna get there. If you have a defective scaffold, how are the blocks gonna line up right? And so you can see where I'm going with this. The scaffold for the maxilla is the resting tongue. It's not just chewing or speaking or any of those um, so, somewhat um, uh, uh, um, short duration um, uh, 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 actions of the tongue. It's mostly the resting posture that has to be there for to balance the, the, the forces that come from the outside with the, the force of the tongue. The tongue rests on the palate. The, the palate, the maxilla literally starts to take the shape of the tongue and then the teeth get guided into place, um, uh, you know, to, to be straight in a jaw that grew properly. But if your mouth is open, if your lips are apart, just you can try it yourself, part your lips just a little bit and see if your tongue is still resting on the roof of your mouth. You don't have to necessarily be a mouth breather to have open mouth posture, um, although it's often stated that way. Um, but because the tongue is not there, the maxilla will collapse in three dimensions of space, and then the teeth try to come in, there's not enough room. Well, big surprise. You know, teeth just don't have the brains to drift in crooked, to turn 45 degrees, to come in lingually, to come in buckly, to get stuck in the bone. They're just trying to follow a path of least resistance, for God's sakes. And they go in wherever they can. And if there's no place to go, how are they supposed to come in straight? So um, John Mew's uh, postural theory or, or, or tropic premise is that the tongue at rest against the palate with the lips lightly sealed and the teeth in or near contact for six to eight hours a day, there'll be ideal facial development uh, and dental development. And you're gonna hear from him on this next series um, that this is something that's rare in industrial societies. So when you have a tongue supported face, the maxilla will grow both forward and downward and broad and wide 
in three dimensions of space. When your mouth is hanging open and your tongue is low, the maxilla is going to sag. It's going to grow more vertically. It's going to get narrow, of course, and, and, and it will um, fail to grow forward the way it should. So, you know, one of the issues in, say, class two malocclusions where you have uh, a large overjet, those upper teeth are likely actually more retrusive than they should be. That it's not just the mandible that has to come forward. And it's not certainly, you don't want to pull the upper jaw back any farther than it already is. It's already a stunted bone. Why would you want to stunt it further? You need to help both jaws grow further, and that's a uh, you know a topic I may not entirely get to to uh, talk about today. But um, the uh, but the upshot is that all faces, no matter what their genetic potential is or their initial conditions, will react in a similar way with lots of variation, of course. And that is the lower part of the face will fail to grow properly. It'll fail to grow fully and it'll fail to grow forward. So we see a flattening in the mid face. We see um, a retrusion of the upper lip. We see um, sometimes the collapsing of the nose. You know, that little hump on the nose, just a hinge where the cartilage is, is sagging. Um, and then of course the mandible will do any number of things depending on serendipity, frankly, and other muscle function. So Mike Mew is calling this craniofacial dystrophy. I am using the term. It's a little bit harsh, perhaps. But until we come up with something better, I'm going to suggest that the result of soft tissue dysfunction is craniofacial dystrophy. And this is what we see in the modern world. And we, what we don't see is people with big, broad, you know, beautiful arches like we used to. The anthropologists are all over this. They cannot find skulls that have crooked teeth, maybe three to 5%. And it's usually those lower anteriors. Everybody, they, every skull that you see has room for 32 teeth. The third molars are supposed to come in. How many times? Do they come in now? 10%, 20% max? We see crooked teeth in 80% of, of the population. That, uh, that, the, 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 the maxilla on the upper right um, used to be very rare. And I don't think they saw this kind of malocclusion in Edward Angle's uh, time. You don't see this in his books. And yet I see it uh, you know, pretty regularly in my office. It's not just the width of the palate, mind you. It's also what the narrow maxilla does to the width of the nasal aperture and hence the breathing spaces. So this is what I see every day in my practice. I did not see it this way originally. I thought that the shape of the face that the patient had was the shape of the face that they should have. And, uh, and I just adopted the teeth to match. Um, but now I look at these faces and I see craniofacial dystrophy as a common, um, common finding. Yes, you can see class ones, you can see high angles, you can see um, a cr you know, crowded, you can see class threes because there's mid-face deficiency with a, ma a mandible that can grow forward. And, the, and, and a lot of these kids had braces when I took these pictures and I was very proud of what I had done. But there was one thing that I wasn't looking at and I learned the hard way. And that is I never asked how well they are breathing. And it hit me like a ton of bricks when Ricardo came into the office after I had finished his braces, I had used a functional appliance. I had corrected a class two without extractions. I was very proud of the way it looked. And here is Ricardo. I didn't see his lip posture. I didn't see how his lips were undertoned, how his mouth was hanging open, how his lips were dry, how his nose had a hump on it. 
And here he is sitting in my dental chair. And on this retainer check, his father tells me, Ricardo has sleep apnea and has been ha sleeping with a, uh, all right, Ricardo, thank you. Has been sleeping with a CPAP for the past three years. Three years while I was treating him, he was supposed to be wearing a CPAP. And I didn't know it. And I'll never make that mistake again. Now, every patient that comes to my office gets properly screened and assessed for breathing problems day and night and what their behavioral outcomes are because of it. Um, it is 2.02. And though I am not completely done, I'm just going to pause for a second and look at where I want to um, finally address. All right, I am going to take another 10 minutes with this uh, remaining, re remaining uh, material. So what I now know is the shape of the face is a risk factor. Now, does every retreated jaw have a small airway? No. Does every full face have a good airway? No. There are variables that influence the way air flows from the tip of the nose to the bottom of the throat, and it's not just the size and shape of the airway. It also can be the stability of the airway. Some people can have a big airway that collapses easily, and there are all kinds of reasons why an airway would collapse. The, the fact that muscle tone and lymph swelling and acid reflux with its uh, irritation of the tissues and fat deposits, certainly um, breathing itself, over breathing and, and mouth breathing is, is hypertensive in that it creates poor circulation and, and delivery of oxygen, infection and inflammation and acute inflammation, vascular congestion and mucus, these are all things now that I have to pay attention to in each and every one of my patients. And they all have one or, or more of these things going, in, you know, going on. And then the behavior piece. Now I know that you've heard about this um, from John and, and, uh, and Roger, so I'm not gonna belabor it, but when we can't breathe well, we will find a way to breathe better. And that's through our mouth, holding the mouth open, uh, breathing fast, using our shoulders and chest side of our diaphragm. Um, over breathing is such an important concept to understand because it, it literally changes the biochemistry of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And if you're not breathing well during the day, you're certainly not gonna be breathing well at night. This is why I say it's not just a sleep problem. It's a breathing problem. Um, and, 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 um, and we have to look at it that way. So I, 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 I take my phone out all the time uh, at the office and I capture these pictures. They're, they are just kids sitting around my office um, and uh, you know some more obvious than, than others, but they all have the one thing that's going to make uh, you know, growth and development a problem and you need to be able to look for it and see it, and that's open mouth posture. Open mouth posture has lots of precursors starting at birth, and, um, and it leads to all kinds of uh, um, uh, 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 unintended consequences, including poor breathing and craniofacial dystrophy and all the muscular dysfunctions that are going to interfere with good growth, development, breathing, you know, learning and all that. And worse uh, than that, um, you know, it has its own negative feedback cycle on, on all of this. So we have to really look at it. Um, I learned from John and Roger originally about the problem with low CO2 and how it restricts perfusion of oxygen in uh, different parts of the body. 
and how um, it, by regulating smooth muscle tone that anything in our body that's a tube will, um, will uh, suffer because of constriction. And then, um, and, and so these are the things that we have to look at structure, function and behavior. And this is the second thing I'd like you to jot down is that you need to both assess and treatment plan for all three things and, um, and, then, um, and then have the tools to deal with them. So <clears throat> in my paradigm shift now, I know that the um, American Association of Orthodontists is stuck on the fact that we're not supposed to treat obstructive sleep apnea. And they're right. That's a medical problem. When I do a screening and I suspect somebody of OSA, they go right to the physician. Do not pass go, do not collect $200, if you know that expression. Instead though, we have to understand that the problem is flow limitation. And that flow limitation is a precursor to OSA and so that we need to deal with it at its origins. So um, here is the uh, timeline that helps me understand what's going on. Dentistry has been involved with OSA for quite some time, but when you start looking at it, not as the problem, but as the end of a long line of problems and understanding that it's really breathing that's the problem, then you have a way of understanding the context of everything that's going on now. That <clears throat> the problem is really airway flow limitation. That flow limitation has craniofacial dystrophy as a primary risk factor. That craniofacial dystrophy is the result of soft tissue dysfunction, especially low tongue posture, open mouth posture, poor swallowing, poor for uh, 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 nasal hygiene. And that the reason so many kids are suffering from this is that we have to compensate for all the stressors of the modern environment. And now we have a way of looking at a complete um, system, a complete context for treatment. Because if we can mitigate the modern environmental stressors, say by giving our kids cleaner food and helping them breastfeed and um, giving them clean air and making sure that they, uh, you know, they, 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 that they can breathe through their nose and so forth, then we can prevent the need for the compensations. We have lots of compensations in our society, including, you know, pacifiers uh, or dummies and uh, uh, and, and, and uh, baby bottles and, and, and all of those kinds of things, uh, pre-chewed food and, and uh, whatnot. And if we don't understand that our kids are developing them, they're going to become habits. And if, the, if, we, can, if we can change the habits early enough, then we can avoid the, the face from growing poorly. When does orthodontic, airway orthodontics start? It starts when you discover the habits that are going to lead to poor growth. I'll let that sink in for a second. It starts when you discover the habits. It has nothing to do with dental, uh, a, a dental, you know, primary or mixed dentition or one phase or two phase or you know, um, uh, 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 the age of the child and when all the rest of the kids are getting braces and all that. Because the truth is, if you wait for braces age, you've bypassed the, the age at which you can affect facial growth. Uh, you know, orthodontists will say, oh, we're going to get take advantage of the growth spurt. Well, really, the growth spurt, so, so to speak, you know, during the... Uh, during the, those changes um, is, is still just the last 20% of craniofacial growth. And by the time braces age rolls around, you, you're gonna have to change the way you orthodontics, you do orthodontics to accommodate the craniofacial dystrophy and try to limit upper airway flow limitation. And of course, lots of adults have had braces with retraction, have had no braces and crooked teeth, 
um, or maybe just didn't grow as well as they should. And now they have all the medical comorbidities of upper airway flow limitation. And this is, a, I mean, if you guys are, are doing prosto or, or um, uh, you know, rebuilding occlusions or TMJ or pain, you have to so, uh, understand that many of those symptoms are the result of the patient struggling both day and night with airway flow limitation. Of course, if you wait for obstructive sleep apnea to, 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 uh, to deal with the thing, then you're at the end stage. You're really prolonging people's life with a CPAP or a, or a mandibular advancement device or maybe jaw surgery. But that's, um, that's where you are. You're at the end of the line. Why would you wanna wait for the heart attack literally the heart attack, but why would you want to wait for a heart attack when you can exercise and eat, eat better and be healthier? Why would you want to wait for sleep apnea before you start taking care of the problem? As dentists, we now have the responsibility for helping kids develop an optimal physiologic airway and breathing pattern, and this is why. So um, for each stage along the way, you have to address structure, you have to address function, you have to address behavior. And, uh, and for each stage along the way, there's a different way of parsing out what's available. And each of us that gets involved are going to pick, you know, different kinds of tools, different kinds of procedures, different kinds of training, but they, you have to address all three. So in my assessment, I mean, I, my, this is my treatment protocol. Fortunately, we're out of time, so I can't get into details, but just think about it this way. You're going to address behavior, function, and structure. And what you can't do by yourself, you're going to have to find somebody else to do. And when you do that, dental alignment and malocclusion doesn't become such a big problem especially if you start early, you can help kids grow up with pretty, pretty straight teeth. I, I hate it when people come to me at, at 12 years old now and they've got crowded teeth and, 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 I, and, I, and I, can, I can do things, but I still have to address all things. Now for behavior, that's training. You have to add a training piece or collaborate to have a training piece done for your patients. They have to be able to breathe through their nose. They have to be able to keep their tongue on the mouth of the roof of the mouth. They have to keep their lips together. They have to be able to swallow properly. They have to have good hygiene, both uh, nasal hygiene and sleep hygiene. They have to be able to stand up straight and, and eat well. And, and if they're uh, tethered oral tissues, you've got to un, uh, do those. I, I tend not to be aggressive about those, but uh, you know, some people understand that they limit function and growth. Now, if I'm going to address function here, I'm going to try to mimic the natural functions of the body with either appliances or exercises or whatever it is to induce the same kind of biological response that the patient would have because of their genetics. That how do we get a, because we were not born for a lack of an alpha or a retainer or an expander. It's only in the past few hundred years that this has become a problem. So how do we start early and mimic the natural conditions? If you're familiar with the alpha appliance, it really all it is is a surrogate for the tongue. And getting the tongue up may take some time, but now you have some, you know, a substitute. On the other hand, sometimes the structure is so damaged already that getting good growth is very difficult to do. And especially when a child is in distress, you have to address that with uh, orthopedics, uh, orthopedic remodeling or orofacial orthopedics or dentofacial orthopedics. It's here that we, we're not taking advantage of natural growth. We're forcing our will on the body. When you put in a palate expander and crank open the midline sutures and force the bones apart, you think you're only affecting that bone? The maxilla is connected to directly or indirectly to all 22 bones of the, of the skull. And they, they work together like clockwork. You're gonna, you're gonna bend one cog in a, in, in a watch and, and think that the rest are gonna function properly? 
And yet when a child is in distress, when they're not able to breathe well, when they're not able to oxygenate, when they're sleeping poorly and damaging the brain with, with not only poor uh, rest and rejuvenation, low um, growth hormone, but also the inflammation that is in, inherent in poor breathing, well, you got to pull the stops out. And so I do this work and I, and I do it um, maybe a little more cognizant than some, that, that other functional things are at play, but I, I will do it because the children's uh, 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 condition demands it. And then you have to build relationships. These can be in your office, they can be out of your office, they can be live, they can be online. There's no reason nowadays that you can't find um, uh, 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 allied health professionals and physicians to deal with this. And if you don't have an, under, uh, an orthodontist that understands this, just keep looking because orthodontists will get the sense that they have to also protect the airway and manage it. And that frankly, this is one of the greatest gifts that they can give to a patient is to be healthy. Yes, a pretty smile, it's a nice prom picture. And yeah, maybe on the first uh, date or the first uh, job interview, a smile is important. But protecting someone from anxiety and depression and getting a good night's sleep and looking, I mean, real beauty is in the face. It's not just the teeth that make you smile, it's your whole face that makes you smile. And so, uh, when we do orthodontics, we do it cognizant of all these things. Okay. That's where I'm going to stop. And um, thank you, Barry. Absolutely wonderful. I, I'm not quite sure. Barry, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I just I wanted to make sure that I stopped sharing my screen. And no problem. There it is. I I, uh, I turned off the button. Okay. Barry, thank you for what has been the most amazing presentation. What has been so significant for me is that you have brought it all together, and what you have stressed is collaboration, and in my opinion, and having been in practice for 40 years now, that is one of the areas where we as a profession, we as a profession have lacked. And it's just so wonderful that the airway should bring us all together. Yeah. Um, and Barry, I'm going to, uh, we've had a plethora of questions, but I'm going to ask you some of the more pertinent ones. I'm going to spend about 10 to 15 minutes on um, questions and then um, I know you have to get back to um, work again and we have to go and have a good night's rest so I'm just going to um, ask what I think could be um, um, relevant questions to ask and of course um, one of the big questions that seems to have popped up quite regularly is this whole issue of the um, COVID pandemic and the fact that children are having to wear masks. And given the fact that this has now become an extended pandemic, a year, two or three years, if it's going to go on, do you feel that it's going to have an effect on the, crani uh, the growth, craniofacial growth and airways of children? Well, to tell you the truth, and you probably learned this from Patrick, and you may have learned it from John, and you probably learned it from Roger, that when a child is hypocapnic, when they're over breathing, that a mask is actually a very helpful thing. And that because it helps a child retain CO2 and start to accommodate to CO2, they will actually deliver oxygen better. Now, I know also that often when I'm wearing my mask, damn things pinching my nose and now I can't breathe through my nose and I, my mouth is hanging open underneath it. Of course, that's not helpful either. But yeah. the principles are just very simple. You can, you can use a mask and keep your lips together and your tongue on the roof of your mouth. Um, and, um, and 
and frankly, I don't see it as unhealthy at all for those that are under, you know, uh, the, the, who's, and we measure CO2 directly, right? You, have you yeah. seen the, uh, Patrick doesn't talk about it so much, but Roger does using the capnometer as part of our screening. Yeah, so, so do I. Yeah. yeah the, we can see who's over breathing and, and what their yeah. breathing pattern is and change it pretty readily. Exactly. And I did Peter Litchfield's master's course. Um, and that's where I met Mark Cruz yeah. as well. Oh, yeah. So, yep, I'm with you 100% of the way. So I hope that everyone out there has heard wearing a mask for children is not, should not adversely affect craniofacial growth and development. Um, then the other questions that I think are um, sh could be um, significant or are uh, significant is do you think there is a relationship between autism and vaccinations. It would, however, be interested to see what the COVID vaccines will do to children in the long term. This is not our field, but do you have a possible personal opinion? So uh, that that's, goes maybe a step further than I would like to address. But uh, what I would like to say is that most kids that have autism also have sleep problems. Mm. Now, what comes first, we don't really know. But I certainly suspect that, um, and with many of the kids that you saw in that, uh, that video, that when you add good breathing patterns, optimal physiologic airway and breathing pattern, breathing through the nose, getting the lips together, um, using the diaphragm, lowering the, the, the uh, volume of ventilation. When kids breathe better, it's more physiologic. This is when you see healing occur. And so I, I see it maybe not as dramatically always as I see in that video, but we look at quality of life um, uh, uh, parameters. I have a questionnaire that looks at 11 parameters and not one says crooked teeth on it. It's all about how well you're breathing through your nose and how's your posture and how's your sleep and you know those kinds of things. We do routinely see improvements in those issues and that's for typical kids and untypical kids. Oxygen helps all of us. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I do... I do understand that bad breathing is inflammatory. Mm. That's the work of David Gozal. It's inflammatory for the brain. Mm. So a brain that's already inflamed might have some trouble coping with things that inflame it all the more. Mm. Of course, one of the reason the, one of the reasons we you do use the vaccine is to produce inflammation. Mm. Training our inflammatory system to recognize certain things, but we're often hopping it up, and sometimes more often than certain kids might need. Mm, so, absolutely. not a bad question. I don't have a direct answer to it, but uh, absolutely. Right. And and Barry, just some practical issues. Um, one of them is um, the question of how do we motivate teens to wear their myo brace. Uh, the same way we motivate them to brush their teeth, to change their underwear, to clean their room, to do their homework, to walk the dog, to practice football, and on and on and on. The problem in motivation is largely that it's not yet well accepted in the general population that this is something that we must make our kids do. And if you ask me, in a few years' time, the, these trainers, whatever brand or design that we choose, will be as ubiquitous as toothbrushes. Yeah. Because once we get the idea that helping a child breathe well is as important as cleaning their teeth, we will be, it, it'll be culturally accepted and it, it, it will be no harder than getting a kid to brush their teeth. <laughs> Absolutely. I have a, a very good way of looking at this. I'd like to say mommy and daddy need to be involved as well. Yeah. And I oh, think something else. Many times the kids that are having difficulty wearing the trainer 
are having difficulty for good reason. Mm -hmm. And so the first three months of trainer wear to me is a triage for looking at what the problems are that this child is facing. You cannot mm -hmm. expect a child to wear something for an hour and when they can't breathe through the nose or to keep it in all night to bed. So I, I, I don't condemn the trainer nor the whole process any more than I would condemn a book if a kid didn't like to read. Yeah. You know, it's a tool. the trainer is a tool for teaching good habits that will help good facial growth. That's how it should be looked at. If that tool doesn't work, then look for another. If, if the protocols don't match what that child needs, then change the protocols. Look to see what you can do to get to the child's level and help them out. Yes, absolutely. And that means involvement from us as clinicians as well. Yeah. In other words- One more thing, if you don't mind, Des. Not at all. In behavioral management, we must, we have to accept the fact that we're going to get a bell curve of results. And God forbid that a dentist should accept a bell curve. You know, we were all <laughs> trained, you know, to get that perfect margin, to get that perfect apical fill, to get that perfect canine guidance. And our brains cannot tolerate variant, variance in results, but we have to. Physicians do. We have to make, we have to get to the point where we say, I'm going to help this kid get better than they would have had they not done this therapy. Yeah. And so, no, kids are not going to get rid of mouth breathing or tongue thrusting entirely, but you're going to make a positive impact on their life if you stick to it and you don't get insulted that the parent says, oh, he's not wearing it. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Barry? Then another uh, question, an interesting one. Is there still a place for headgear in orthodontic treatment? What can be done for an adult with sleep apnea? I assume that is obstructive sleep apnea because, of course, we get central and mixed apnea. So, um, so what can be done for an adult with sleep apnea whose orthodontic treatment involved the use of headgear from the age of eight? Okay. So... First of all, you have to define which kind of headgear. Is yeah. it the one that's pushing backward on the maxilla or is it the one that's pulling forward on the maxilla? Uh, those are two very different animals. And they, they represent the, uh, the philosophy of, and the orthodoxy of the orthodontist. Because when you use a cervical pull or even a high pull headgear, and you know you can, perhaps have certain goals in mind. There are some rare instances where say uh, upper primary second molars have, um, have exfoliated too early, molars drifted forward, you want to distalize them you know, for, for arch length. So th there are certain circumstances, but pretty much the cervical headgear, the best place for that is in the garbage can as far as I'm concerned. But forward pull headgear by all means now, you have a little less um, flexibility in the growth of the bones and the way they'll respond. But they, there is some evidence that they will respond favorably to the pressures and the, and the vectors that are going to help them grow better. Yeah. But the principles are really the same. You need to establish laminar flow from the tip of the nose to the bottom of the throat which means that you need to create more space for the tongue and you need to open up the breathing spaces. So we're doing a lot of that for adults. I, I, I do tend to use surgically assisted techniques, mm -hmm. whether it's um, uh, periodontally assisted or, um, or, or the osteogenic or orthopedics, you know, uh, Wound, I mean, it's kind of traumatic. We're wounding the bone to get a healing reaction. And, and you, do, you do some of that with uh, bone grafting and you can create tremendous amounts of bone space in a relatively yeah. short period of time. We're using aligners to do it now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, can, you can do maxillary expansion and it may require a, cer a, cervical, uh, a surgical assist. Of course, bimaxillary surgery is probably indicated for most of us though, that is, of course, the most invasive and usually saved for the, the, the most refractory cases. 
Absolutely. I'm going to ask two more questions. The one is, is malocclusion more pronounced in the inner city versus suburbia versus the countryside? What mm -hmm. about black children versus white children in the inner city? Yeah. So um, there were some interesting studies uh, on that where um, uh, Robert Corricini uh, compared inner city and, and rural twins that grew up and so forth. But more than make generalizations, it really is important to understand what compensations that child had to adopt no matter where they are. Mm. Now, there's certainly, uh, I'm sure, many examples of kids living in beautiful, clean, you know, non-sooty environments that have allergies to, you know, to, uh, to, to, to uh, plants and so forth and wind up breathing through their mouth. Um, you know, I, it's, it's really individualistic. The work by um, um, Weston Price still fascinates me because whether he got everything about biochemistry right or not, the fact that any population anywhere in the world, no matter their uh, racial background, um, once they change from ancestral diet to an industrial diet within one generation, they will start to exhibit um, uh, uh, dental, dental signs first. They'll start to exhibit pe periodontal disease, caries, and malocclusion. And then in the next generation, it starts to become the, the um, you know, metabolic disorders, and then it's obesity, and then it's diabetes, and then it's cardiovascular disease. Yeah. Every generation gets worse, and that's where we are. Absolutely. We are down the generations, and there are people who are saying that we are facing a, you know, a fifth extinction, not just because of global warming and changing environment, but the fact that we cannot well adapt, well enough adapt to... Absolutely. You know, Our environment. Yeah. I have a wonderful, very simple explanation. The mouth is the gateway to human health. Yeah. And then, and they know two more important structures. We tend to think below the belt, but it's the nose and the mouth. <laughs> and just one more question: Should children be taught to chew real food as opposed to drinking their McDonald's burgers through a straw? Yeah. With some, I mean, you can you can eat a McDonald's burger and literally not chew it if you just let it sit there long enough; it'll dissolve on its own. And it is, you know, uh, uh, it is hard to get away from the industrial foods, but many people are doing it, and they're making a concerted effort to do good nursing early on, to transition their kids to foods that really require chewing and uh, to limit the amount of uh, short chain sugars that they're, that they're getting. And, and it makes a difference. I, I, but one warning, no, no matter what technique or approach you're using, we are not going to be able to fix this in one generation. We really have to start taking a longer view of what's going on. This is something that humans are terrible at. We can kick the can down the road another year or two or decade. We seem to be happier about any problematic condition. Yeah. And so most of us as dentists and orthodontists, we really have to get the context right. It's not about developing a wide arch and pretty teeth. It has to be something far greater than ourselves. They were talking about helping our generations, our great, great grandchildren to have at least half a chance of becoming productive citizens. And right now, 70% ain't good enough and it's only gonna get worse unless we do something about it. Absolutely, Barry. That is a wonderful statement to end on. And if I may just say to my colleagues out there, as someone who's been in the industry for 40 years and into my mid-60s, I am just so impressed by the 
enthusiasm and the way that the younger generation of my colleagues are looking at things. It's just absolutely inspiring for me. And that's why it's for me also just a mission to help guide them as much as we can. Barry, thank you for what has been the most awesome presentation. And um, if I may say, it's, it's a privilege to have you as a friend and as a mentor. And I look forward to having you invited to South Africa once we've got this virus under control. It'll be an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.